Hey folks, Mackenzie Lambert here. This past Saturday I was able to catch three blocks at the Amazing Fantasy Fest, hosted by Buffalo filmmaker Gregory Lamberson. This is the latest iteration of previous Buffalo-based festivals, Buffalo Screams, and Buffalo Dreams. Full disclosure, I am one of the sponsors of the event. I chipped in money to support it. I have no financial ties or production involvement to any of the films being reviewed. The first film block of the day, Block 5, featured Kurt Markham's Ragdoll Assassin, a film involving an ambitious crime boss, his eccentric henchmen, an overworked doctor, and bumbling cops. The crime boss, Dino Infantino, attempts to kill Ragdoll Assassin for losing the drugs from a recent heist. Each henchman has a gimmick, and the gimmick of Ragdoll Assassin is she brings a doll on every job she's assigned. Part of Ragdoll's assassin's brains end up on the Ragdoll and brings the doll to life. I don't consider this a spoiler since it happens in the first 10 minutes. I appreciate the absurdity of the premise and was going along with it until the climax at the end. I was able to suspend my disbelief, but the climactic sequence went too far. Imagine seven psychopaths for 90% of the movie, and then at the end, it's Evil Dead 2. That's how jarring it is. Overall, the cast has fun with the material. The scene stealer for me was Lauren Kaler as Ivory Tower. The character is really a clever satire on what a right winger would think of for a gender studies experimental film double major. Amelia Favada as Ashley the Ragdoll Assassin gives the film its heart. Despite the technical issues that plagued the screening, the audience got to see the film and appreciate the fruit of Kurt Markham's labor. The second film block, Block 6, featured Ken Whiting's Rich Interior Lives. A lot of this film's premise relies upon the film going in as blind as possible, but the IMDb summary and the one-line pitch in the Amazing Fantasy Fest program show their hand. Yet that information, it anticipates any confusion of the audience that may have happened otherwise. We are introduced to Colt and Mary, a couple we see almost right away in a contentious relationship. This opening is a needling back and forth between an insecure man and a headstrong woman that punctuates with an act of physical intimidation. This scene sticks with me the whole film and I know which character I'm already taking sides with. We soon meet two other characters, siblings Dana and Logan. Dana clearly has a huge crush on Colt, Logan is still harboring bitterness over past events the audience is clued in on. For 75% of the film, the tension rises before a Coen Brothers caliber twist and we're in a completely different situation. And then another incident happens and the tone is drastically changed. I absolutely hated Colt, Dana, and Logan. Colt reminded me of a Christian fundamentalist ex I had. Dana was melodrama personified. Logan is one of those people who peaked in high school athletics and it was all downhill after. More credit to actors Parker Shook, Kyla Ryan, and Gregory Shelby. If I hate your character, that's a good thing. It means you're doing your job as an actor. Teresa Byrne as Mary is the perfect surrogate for the audience. It is through her inquiry we get the information as an audience. From the get-go, we are firmly in her shoes for a majority of the film. If there is an issue, it's the swerve twist fatigue. Too many attempts to keep the audience on their toes or pulling the rug from underneath them can be a problem. But I still remained invested in the film despite disliking three-fourths of the characters I was stuck with. The final block I attended, Black 7 for the day, opened with the short film Forward, directed by Paul McGinnis. Paul and I go back at least to 2010. I've shared a few movie productions and get-togethers with McGinnis. Emil Novak's Decayed, Gregory Lamberson's Dry Bones, to name a few. Forward marks his directorial debut and makes quite an impression. Sensitivity warning. 
forward centers on a woman who was on the brink of suicide who talks to a, a friend that calms her down. The troubled woman has been the victim of emotional and verbal abuse by her boyfriend. That's, it. That's as much of a plot summary as I want to share. This is a short film you should go in knowing as little as possible. Paul is known for his sense of humor, being a lighthearted guy. He wrote the script Killer Rack, a movie musical about Lovecraftian breast implants which makes forward a radical departure from the norm, and he pulled it off. Jessica Zwolak, I apologize if I mispronounce the name, uh, as the abuse survivor and Amanda Woomer as the friend, are the two characters we spend the most time with. Both of these actresses take the material seriously, both effectively relay a sense of urgency. They were also the most important roles of the film. If these performances didn't work, the film would have fallen short of its objective, telling a serious story about a serious issue. Props to Paul and company for making an effective short film. I'm happy he's taken the initiative and continuing to make his mark in the Buffalo film scene. Jessica and Amanda succeed in bringing life to this short film. I hope this film becomes publicly available soon because it is worth a watch. The feature film for Black 7 was the Austin Snell film, They Call Her Death. If you're like me and you enjoy your 70s Italian exploitation, you're going to want to continue listening. They Call Her Death is a callback to the grimier titles of the Spaghetti Western. Not the Sergio Leone films, but the grittier offerings by the like of Sergio Corbucci, Lucio Fulci, and Zoji Castellari. This is easily one of the best films I've seen all year. Sherry Ripple is Mary Prey, wife of a reformed outlaw, who was witness to the death of her husband at the hands of a bounty hunter. On her quest for vengeance, she uncovers a scheme by the local authorities to achieve political power. Mary Prey's attire while seeking retribution comes off as a cowboy variant of Fumetti Niri a la Diabolic. Sherry Ripple carries the film on her shoulders as the lead, as Mary Prey, she takes a beating and comes back to dish out her own. Austin Snell wore multiple hats on this production, director, editor, writer, and even composing some of the music. Over the course of three years, this movie was shot and edited as production progressed. This was a labor of love, and Snell deserves all the credit in the world for completing this gem. If you're paying homage to Fulci, there better be some juicy gore. The film more than delivers. Much of the bloody spectacle earn applause from the Buffalo, New York audience. You get bloody throat spray, bloody exit wounds, intestines cut out, even an eyeball on a fork. Oh, and uh, the interrogation scene of an outlaw. Every man in the audience crossed his legs for the entire scene. Shot in 16mm, the film looks gorgeous. There was a sheen, a polish I haven't seen in a film since Anna Biller's The Love Witch. The film stood out even more in a sea of movies shot on digital. In a Q&A, Austin Snell said he'll continue to shoot on film for as long as he makes movies. Onward, Celluloid Soldier. Uh, this movie is currently on the festival circuit. If there is a distributor within the reach of this video, please pick this movie up. This movie deserves to be seen by as many eyes as possible. Highly, highly recommend this movie. And that wraps up this look at the Saturday showings at the Amazing Fantasy Film Fest. With my work schedule, I will be able to at least catch the final film block on Thursday, September 19th, uh, which will be the Canadian horror film The Damnation. Uh, until then, this is Mackenzie Lambert of Mac and the Movies, signing off.